The agenda this week unearthed some of the hidden costs of our food system, probed the potential for boosting the competitive edge of Ontario small businesses, and debated what to do about ISIS-involved extremists returning to Canada. The agenda's week in review begins by evaluating the prospects for greater greening of the electricity sector. One of the, one of the exciting things I see is capturing that extra energy. And there's extra energy in nuclear, there's extra energy in hydro, and there's extra energy in the intermittent uh, wind and, and, uh, and solar that we're talking about. So if we can capture that and hold that energy, that clean energy that I think has greater value in the long run in our society, in our world, um, that to me is the go forward program. That's where we need to take this thing. And we need to reduce costs. I understand the reduction of costs. I understand the economics of everything. I, not of everything, but a lot. But I think if we work in that direction and not put all our eggs in one basket, but have that diversity of supply, build in energy storage to really maximize the performance of all the excess okay, energy but, on the grid, all the excess I, energy on the grid. But I also don't think you can look at the prices of yesterday and yeah. say that that's what's going to decide the fate right. of tomorrow. Okay, but, well, if you look at solar, if you look at solar, if you look at solar and how much it's come down, you look at storage. You know, we have a service we call regulation service. Yeah. And that that is what when, when there's sudden changes in, in minute by minute changes in supply mm -hmm. and demand, we need technologies to be able to be there to balance that out. And we re recently had an RFP and the two, the two projects that went were both storage projects. You're, you're they were both the projects that, that, and so it demonstrates to me how they can compete uh, economically. Kara wants it. Yes. Kara wants so, it. So, I mean, you have to also uh, remember that Ontario has always, throughout history, looked to have a diversity of supply. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, even with nuclear, we always had hydro, we had uh, coal, we had oil, we had then brought in natural gas. And so, this is just further diversity of the supply. And just don't forget that nuclear plants, great in terms of baseload supply, hydro, great baseload. They run 24-7, massive surpluses at night and off peak. And in yeah. the past, we've dumped those massive surpluses if, if we into the United States and into Quebec. Now, if we would plug those into batteries, yeah. into electric cars, we're actually going to take better advantage. And OPG that runs those nuclear plants has said that, in fact, they think prices will go down yeah. if we were to maximize the use of that nighttime power into batteries and cars, because then we'll be yeah. using those resources more efficiently. One more line to Steve, and then I'm yeah. going to move on. Toronto, for the, in this last cold snap, Toronto residential heat demand was in the neighborhood of 12 million kilowatts, 12,000 megawatts. That's the entire Ontario nuclear fleet. Pick Pickering, Darlington, Bruce, all the units running at capacity 24-7. That's the, to cover the residential heating demand for Toronto. Yes. We're by a deliberate policy choice not heating with electricity. We're handing that market over to natural gas, fossil mm -hmm. fuel. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've made electricity expensive because of these intermittent, unreliable yeah. sources that I'm talking about. So that's the, that's the okay. bottom let me, of this. Let me get out of cities for a second, and I want to go way up north. Mm -hmm. You're doing work way up north. We are. You're trying yeah. to tell us what you're trying to do with remote communities. We are working with uh, Indigenous communities in the north, um, uh, mostly the Inuit at this stage, um, and we're, we are looking to build microgrids in these communities. There's a high reliance on diesel. The costs are enormous. The economics are there now. To do Adverse micro health effects are there too. Absolutely, you know that. And we have to get uh, cheaper energy to them. And we have to start producing food in the north. We have to start thinking totally different about the whole dynamics of how uh, uh, how the indigenous people live in the north. And so these are things that are very exciting. Uh, we are we've signed three deals, three with three communities in the north, and we are doing the assessments, the wind assessments, the you know looking at the combination of wind, solar, and uh, and uh, and battery technology with backup genera generation to start. That's how we see this going forward. But they will generate their own electricity they will. needs, and we are doing it in partnership with them. Our interest is to become partners with them, and our store wants to partner with remote communities to to really drive that change. In the north. So they could generate and store their own electricity needs and who knows, maybe even feed into the grid someday? It, well, they're, it's, these are all small communities, about mm -hmm. 200 small communities okay. in the north that many of them just are reliant on a generation not connected to a grid. Uh, Kualawit has a utility that is connected to, uh, to quite a population, but beyond that, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great opportunities. Let me follow up with Terry on this notion that I just raised. 
that we're not someday in the maybe not too distant future just going to be extracting electricity needs from the grid, but we're actually going to be generating our own and putting it into the grid absolutely. for distribution? Can you absolutely. explain how that well, would work? Absolutely. You, can, you look at electric vehicles as one of those potentials mm -hmm. where you, on off-peak hours, you can draw the electricity to, to charge your vehicle. But if we're at a, at a point in time where uh, during the day where you need that electricity, you can plug it back in and be a supplier. It's, it's, you, the, right. this is where technology it is goes both ways. It goes both ways. And this is the way the system is changing so yeah. much. And this is why, I, I mean, I take Steve's point. I mean, nuclear last year accounted for over 60% of all of the electricity that was consumed. But we can't have a system that's reliant on one technology. Okay. Not on wind and solar, not on, not on nuclear. So we need that healthy supply. Kara's going to have to help me understand this because if I, well, look at, I drive a Chevy Volt, okay? It's a plug-in car. And I love it. But I'll tell you something, when you try to find a place to plug in your car that's not at home, yeah. I can plug in at home, but if you want to go to a public parking lot, if you want to park underneath in, in you know, some building downtown, it's pretty it's hard challenging. to find, yeah. yeah. So yeah. How's this, how is this scenario going to happen with so few plug-ins right. available? Well, what we're finding is about 80% of us, of course, plug in at home uh, off peak. Right. And that's the cheapest time, that's the, the most efficient time, and it's when most people are, are you know, at home anyway, so it's a, it's a good time to do it. <laughs> If you're trying to plug in in public places, it is, I have to say, improving. Here's you in the book. The Canadian economy is dominated by oligopolies, startups that seek to break in, reach a certain size, then stall. This is a severe problem in a global economy because for the most part, the companies that make up those oligopolies are unheard of outside our borders. They aren't industry leaders, they don't connect us to global supply chains, to the rest of the world, they're irrelevant. But here at home, they're all too relevant, ensuring that consumers are gouged, innovation is severely constrained, and Canada falls further and further behind countries where competition is promoted and ambition is not a dirty word. You know, there is something about the Canadian character that mistrusts unbridled ambition. You yeah. ran into this, didn't you, yeah. in your own situation? Tall poppy syndrome. It's been there for 150 years. It goes and back to our roots as a British colony. Yeah. It really is. If anyone gets too big or too ambitious or too successful, mm -hmm. we almost relish in their downfall. I mean, we mm -hmm. relished in the downfall of RIM. This is a really important, great, globally dominant company. Mm -hmm. Started right here in southern Ontario. And I had at one point a number one leadership position in the world in the business they were in. It was in probably our biggest brand in the I, whole world. Absolutely, probably, maybe, and Black Nortel Bear. is another example, yeah. where, you know, Canadians, so we, we need to stop uh, celebrating <laughs> failures like that and relishing in it and cutting down people that are ambitious. We need to celebrate those people. And the good news is, there are so many great Canadian success stories. We just, we don't have to give up what we hold dear in terms of our modesty and our decency and our, our you know, our, our sort of, like belief that everything is is good. We, we all those things are are things we hold dear. We have to hold on to those, but we can still dominate globally and go out and play to win. I want to I know we touched on this earlier, but I want to go a little more in depth right now on the notion of whether governments, as Anthony has suggested in his book, need to get behind various businesses or various sectors in a way which actually puts them in the position of picking winners and losers either in that sector or picking winners and losers of sectors to begin with. What's the, what does the data tell us on, on the advisability of doing that? Well, the, the, the governments have a very long history of being very bad at picking winners and losers. And so this is where you end up with very costly and very ineffective public policy. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there's a way that we can champion businesses to grow and use public policy to, to help achieve it. So if, if instead of championing just small business as a category, we've put more emphasis on growing businesses. And so, you know, if we look at um, high, high growth businesses that often get, gets called, get called gazelles, you know, these are companies that over three years grow at, you know, 20% a year. Well, if, you, if, the market, if the market, the private sector is demonstrating that that company is a winner, you know, then government could basically say, okay, so how do we actually remove barriers to the continued growth of that, of that firm? So if you look at the World Economic uh, Forum data, it shows that Canada is, is the second best place in the world to start a business. You know, it only takes two processes, it takes 15 days, and you can, you can have a business up and going in Canada, which is astounding when you compare to, you know, compare to other, other, other places like in Europe. 
But when you look at the ability to scale a business, that's where Canada falls down. So we, we're great at launching businesses, but we're, we're not very good at, at scaling businesses. And so the question is, how, how, do, how do you achieve this? And the traditional government approach has been, has been to pick sectors. But high growth firms are found in every sector, every industry, uh, various sizes. And so I, I do think that policy can be used, but it has to be used in a more effective way. All right, let's go to Greg Sabera next. Uh, when you were in government, when you were minister, I'm not sure actually you were minister of finance at the moment it happened, but you, in the lead up to it were, uh, the government of Ontario and the United States and Canada all decided in their wisdom to put billions into saving the auto industry. Right. That is yeah. clearly picking winners and losers, and you guys decided to bet on big auto. In hindsight? Uh, I think it was... Uh an inevitable decision. The auto sector in North America was too important and we were trying to save an economy and you just couldn't uh, accept a result where tens of thousands of auto workers were uh, no longer uh, uh, with work. So that's okay to pick winners so and losers I, in that I think, you know, I think picking sectors is okay. Uh, in my first year as finance minister, we picked the uh, media sector, arts and entertainment and filmmaking. Uh, and the decision that we made resulted in an industry that has grown every year well beyond uh, the average economic growth and is part of the, uh, the economy of the city of Toronto and the province of Ontario. Because of the subsidies and tax breaks you gave to producers. That's exactly right. And if, and, 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 and if you look mm -hmm. at, uh, uh, you all balked when I mentioned Bombardier. Most <laughs> large uh, uh, countries like Canada uh, support an aerospace sector. Uh, whether it's uh, Boeing or uh, Airbus, uh, Airbus or whatever, and we have to be in that business. Do we? Uh, uh, we can buy well, their stuff. You know what? I, I, do we? I think we do. We don't have uh, a competitive I think advantage it's, uh, in it. Uh, well, you know what? Every time you fly out of uh, uh, the island airport, you're on a Bombardier. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't be on something else. I, 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 that's I, that's, okay. it, so it's I'm cost saying benefit. I don't it's mind benefit, picking right? uh, the aerospace sector and saying we want to be a player. Not the large, not a very large, large player, but a player, and I'm okay with it. Anthony, tell me what you mean then when you say you want governments to be in there picking winners and losers well, in well, some Well, that's respects. an important clarification here, okay. Steve. I'm not proposing that government picks winners. What I'm saying is government's going to do along the lines what Craig was talking about, where we enable that business that has a proven gazelle, that is a proven high growth firm, we enable it to grow faster and scale in Canada. Oh, what I'm saying in terms of doubling down on winners is that once the private sector once a certain amount of private capital, venture capital, has gone into a business, into a high growth firm, and it's clearly on its way to becoming a gazelle, that's when government would be making that double down effort. To do what? So government's not making the choice. The private sector, with the related expertise, is making the choice. Okay, I understand the I, distinction, I propose but what do you a number want of to do? things. So for yeah. starters, I'm saying, if, a, if a, whatever amount of private capital has gone in, uh, three million, four million, five million dollars into a high growth startup, government matches that amount with a non-dilutive loan. And the only term on the loan is, if you leave, move your headquarters out of Canada, the loan is immediately repayable. Hmm. And we help that business scale faster. An existing, proven startup that's already a high growth firm, we just help accelerate its growth and help it export globally. We have 835 million people being hungry, but we are producing enough food for everybody. We have 24 billion tons of fertile topsoil we are using annually, gone by the wind and the rain. But, and we also know that by 2030 we will have to feed 9.5 billion people. It's pretty clear that doing more of the same is not a recipe for success and therefore we have to change agriculture in order to feed a growing population and in order to develop our societies towards sustainability. Agriculture is in the center, but people don't recognize it. People are only looking at the market prices and the kilocalories consumed. And our report wants to provide a different perspective in order to be able to feed future generations and to keep the planet healthy. Then let's dive in. Why, Ruth, in your judgment, is it important for us to understand what you call the true cost of food? So I think, first of all, I'd like to just differentiate between price and cost. Okay. So what's the price of a fast food hamburger? I think it's about 250. Mm -hmm. That's the price of that hamburger. Uh, the cost of that hamburger is actually, actually a lot more, and it includes the cost of deforestation in the Amazon. It includes greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere uh, from the transportation of that meat from the Amazon to Canada. Hmm. It includes medical costs that are skyrocketing now due to higher rates of stroke and obesity at the hospital. 
So food is really one of the most defining things. Uh, and it goes beyond the price you actually see in the store. So obviously the $2.50 we pay for that hamburger, none of that comprises all of the extra costs that you just indicated. Exactly, what we call externalities, costs okay. that are external to the cost of that hamburger. So unless we understand the true costs, we're actually not going to be able to make informed and good decisions about where we need to go. So we need to understand those true costs so that businesses, for instance, can make better decisions about their supply chains, so that governments can make better decisions about their policies, so that consumers can make better decisions at the supermarket. Um, and unless we really see that full picture, we're actually not going to get where we need to go, as Alexander had alluded. So um, when we look at issues like mass migration, uh, climate change, skyrocketing healthcare costs, uh, all of these are very complex. There are many interdependencies in that system. And without understanding that full system, we're not going to be able to make good decisions and understand the trade-offs and how we actually really get to a sustainable future. Are you suggesting, Alexander, that if we were to put all of those externalities, you call them, into the cost of that hamburger, that that hamburger clearly is not two and a half bucks anymore. It is what? First of all, we would like to recognize that there are hidden costs. All the costs Ruth has mentioned. And we also have to recognize that our farmers are working in an economic environment which is highly distorted. A farmer which is a good steward of the soil doesn't get paid for it. A farmer who is mining and extracting all the nutrients and is depleting the land gets the same price for his product. And therefore, we first want to make people aware that producing food is a highly complex issue and that we are using natural resources and the market is not paying for it. Nobody wants to triple or quadruple the price of food. But policy decisions have to be based on the true cost of food. And at the same time, we see that diet is the health risk number one in the world. So we are already paying a lot at, for cheap food. The World Health Organization has published a report that diabetes type 2 young people getting diabetes because of malnutrition, this costs annually 850 billion. So cheap food is already very, very expensive today. Right. And therefore, the, the, the whole system is not working and it's undermining the ability to feed future generations. So time to act. Really, it's not about making um, you know, cheap, unhealthy, highly processed food more expensive. It's about changing the price signals. Mm -hmm. So as a Canadian taxpayer, I give taxes to the government. The government makes decisions about where to direct subsidies. And we have a choice. Do we want those directed to highly processed food or do we want those directed to a healthy system that's truly sustainable? And again, the price of cheap food today is really very, very high if you include the health costs. Yes. And this is not only an issue in developed countries, increasingly in developing countries. If you go to Kenya, the Minister for Health tells you, I don't know how to finance my health system because the costs mm -hmm. of obesity and diabetes too are skyrocketing. But that's not a cost that is borne by the company that makes the bad food that gives people diabetes. That's a cost incurred by the taxpayer. So how do you get the company to care about that public sector cost? We, we, we have to consider food as a system. So far, it's a silo. Agriculture, processing, distribution, health system. We have to look at it in a comprehensive way. And then we come to a completely different perspective. Let us set up our discussion with some numbers here that may just help put all of this into perspective. These numbers, according to the U.S. intelligence group, the Sufan Center, by the end of October last year, at least 5,600 ISIS fighters had returned from Iraq and Syria to their countries of origin. Let's break that down a bit. More than 3,400 left from Russia to fight. That's the highest contributing country. 400 of them have returned. More than 3,200 came from Saudi Arabia. 760 of those returned. Of the more than 1,900 that left France, more than 300 have returned. And of the 850 that have left from the United Kingdom, half have returned. Meanwhile, the federal government here says it is aware of more than 190 extremists with a connection to Canada, suspected of terrorist activity. Now overseas, nearly half of them have gone to Syria, Iraq, or Turkey. And today, the government believes about 60 foreign fighters who joined ISIS and other terrorist groups in the region have now returned to Canada. Okay, let's figure out what to do here. Uh, Christian, let's get you in on this first. How has Canada's approach to dealing with returning ISIS supporters compared to what other countries around the world are doing? 
So I think there's four strategies here that we've seen countries take on this. Uh, one is uh, what Russia, Australia, the UK, France have been doing, which is essentially trying to do their best to make sure that individuals do not return. Uh, that is to say they have special forces assets in the regions and they've made it explicit that they are targeting at least some of their citizens. Uh, then there's the Danish approach, which is sort of much more focused on reintegration with some prosecution. The German approach, which is more focused on prosecution, but some efforts at reintegration, depending on, on your background, uh, and the Canadian approach, which is basically that we've sat by and not done a whole lot. Uh, but that's also a function of strategy and context. If you're Australian and you know that your citizens have been targeted, for instance, in Bali or so, then you're concerned about returnees who might be uh, returning to the region and cause instability, who might be targeting your own citizens in tourist destinations. Uh, so there is also, I guess, somewhat of a rationale why different countries are taking different types of uh, approaches to this type of problem. Uh, but it does show that there are other ways of dealing with it, and there are ways of dealing with it within the rule of law on both the reintegration side, the strategic reintegration side, and the strategic prosecution side, uh, as Germany has done, and as Germany has done quite successfully. Okay, let's break this down a bit here. Ritu, we've, we've heard Christian lay out the different options that different countries are sort of pursuing. Would you agree with his assessment that Canada really, I think in his words, hasn't done much so far on this? I think the Canadian government has taken a fairly balanced approach. We have um, our law enforcement and intelligence services who monitor and will assess the threat. If there are, and again, I'd like to stress that there's a very small number of individuals returning uh, to Canada. They will assess the threat. They will use a number of tools in their kit uh, to address it so they could remove passports, they can monitor, they can investigate, and where it's appropriate, they will prosecute. But there are some challenges around that. As well, and this is where the role of the Canada Center comes in, we are trying to support reintegration, disengagement efforts, and other kinds of prevention tools at the local level so that we have a well-rounded, comprehensive approach to address returnees, as well as other individuals in Canada radicalizing to violence. Mubin, let me get your take on the approach that some countries are taking, namely to try their best to kill these people in the field so they don't come home. What's your view on that? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and uh, the UK, I think, International Development Minister was on record as saying that as well, that we need to take them out in the battlefield before they come back. And that's a perfectly valid response. Uh, these are hostile combatants. They're in a combat zone. Uh, they're fair targets in that sense. Should we be doing that in Canada? Absolutely, we should be doing it. We should be working with uh, allied forces, coalition forces, uh, other special operations forces, whether it's just intelligence support, whether it's actually embedding uh, or deploying um, soft members from the Canadian forces, uh, we should definitely be doing that as well. I'm going to come back to you later in the discussion because you are personally involved in some efforts to reintegrate once some of these combatants come back here. Terrorists will use whatever sure. language. What, what is the appropriate word in your view? Combatants or terrorists? What should uh, well, we be calling I'd them? I'd say violent extremists, uh, okay. because terrorist seems to be a legal term uh, if you've been convicted of terrorism, so okay. we'll say violent extremists. Good enough. Kyle, your view on the four options here. Should we be favoring one over another? I think in this case, we really have to look at the prosecution angle, specifically for one particular reason. Um, ISIS as a group has collectively committed uh, severe mass atrocity crimes that fall under international uh, law and domestic Canadian law. You want to uh, just make a bit of a checklist of what that might yeah, be? Yeah, well, we, we, have, we have a genocide against the Yazidi uh, ethnic minority in Iraq. We've had the sexual slavery of women and children. Uh, we've had the destruction of cultural heritage sites. We've seen terrorist attacks against NATO allies and in, in European cities, attempts in Canada, um, propaganda incitement to commit violence across the world using social media. So to me, um, ISIS is not just about terrorism. There's also an international legal aspect uh, of crime against humanity, of genocide, that this group has committed that really does provide a different angle of how we should look at this. And, and you know, Canada's a signatory of the Genocide Convention. It says in the Genocide Convention, we have to prevent genocide. We also have to punish those who commit these acts. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review for this Friday, January 12th, 2018. You can see all of those conversations in their entirety. They're on our website, tvo.org, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. And thanks to our nightly Twitter live stream on our Periscope page. That's periscope.tv slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. 
Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.